Hi everyone, and welcome to the DevSecOps track. My name is Lars de Fever, and I'm a volunteer uh, in the OWASP community, and I'll be moderating this session. So during the next 45 minutes, we'll hear uh, Ann Turner present plain and simple, the art of writing clearly. Uh, please submit any questions you may have uh, in the Q&A tab. Um, and with that, I'll uh, hand over the, the words to you, Ann. Take it away. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Lars. Uh, let me just um, get my screen sharing and hopefully not mess this up right on the spot. Okay, give me one sec. Okay, is everything sharing okay? Can you see my title slide? Yeah, I see the slide deck. Fantastic. Okay, brilliant. Thanks everyone for joining my talk today. Uh, plain and simple, the art of writing clearly. All of us have come across uh, writing that's almost impossible to interpret, whether that's legalese running for pages in service contracts, business speak of blue sky thinking and mission statements, or commercialese in every sales pitch that we've ever been presented. What we don't always recognize, though, is that we too communicate in our own mysterious language. As security professionals and developers, our jargon dictionary is full to bursting. Our technobabble is quite frankly, mind boggling. A lot of the information that we communicate is in writing. Um, emails, reports, design documents, manuals and wikis. And the quality of that communication can be the link between what we do and the recognition that what we do has value. It can also make the difference between uh, whether we get budget and resource for things that we need, whether people take the actions that we need them to take. So in this talk, I'm going to break down the principles of plain language to help you communicate clearly, plainly to whoever it is you're writing for, whether that's board members, technical peers uh, or new starters. I'll explain how plain language benefits everyone, no matter their experience, knowledge, or level of literacy. And I'll also give you some practical tips that you can use to help make your writing more effective, whatever you're trying to say. Uh, just try to get this to move on. Before um, I get into the main part of my presentation, I thought I'd just uh, give you a quick introduction to myself. Um, my name's Anne, and when I'm not at work or annoying my cats, I can be found around the virtual roads of Watopia or any of the other worlds in Zwift. Um, I ride an obscene amount of kilometers in that game, um, but hey, fitness without leaving home. Um, professionally, I've spent 14 years working in various um, information security consultant roles, both uh, within internal security teams, consulting with other areas of business, and also as an external um, security consultant, assessor, auditor. Um, I've been um, really, I've, I've been a, a security standards and, and risk management specialist through most of my security career. Um, I actually came into security uh, through training and communications. Um, my background, my educational background is in language and linguistics. So not the study of multiple languages, but um, the way that languages work, um, effectively the science of language. Um, in all of the roles that I've had within security, I've functioned really as a bit of a translator between my technical colleagues within security teams, engineering departments, and, um, and then with non-technical teams in other parts of the business from senior management to um, end users, call center agents, and so on. More recently, I actually have left my consultant role and have set up my own business, um, Affinity Editorial, working as a cybersecurity specialist, writer, editor, and proofreader. Um, so without further ado, I will get into the main um, part of my talk today. Uh, just 
one final thing before I do, I, I want to just add a quick caveat that my talk is about plain language today, um, not plain English, but because the conference is, is in English, um, I'm an English speaker and my other linguistic knowledge is uh, language knowledge is um, dismally small, I'm working on it. Um, my examples will be in English, but all of the concepts and principles that I talk about today um, apply across most languages. Um, so I hope that there is something that's useful in this talk for everyone. Okay. So the technology sector has a huge vocabulary of terms and the security sector even more so. So we have um, specialist terms, uh, things like ransomware or phishing, um, malware. These mean very um, specific things. They may well have started out as, um, as jargon terms uh, that have now been adopted more widely as, as part of our specialist language, if you like, for the community. Um, one word that I think is a really interesting one under the specialist terms is an, is, is an exploit. So one of the things that's interesting about a lot of our specialist terminology within security is a lot of the language is borrowed from other um, parts of life, really. So exploit as a verb, to exploit something is to take advantage of something, that's fine. Most people understand the word exploit in that context. But we actually use exploit as a noun um, describing um, a thing that does the exploiting, right? So an exploit takes advantage of a vulnerability or a weakness in, in an organization. I think that that's a really um, interesting example of the way that we have got our own sort of, um, however familiar some of these phrases are within everyday life, we actually have a really specialist um, definition for them, especially in certain contexts. Other types uh, of, of language that we have are, are jargon terms. So these are perhaps more things like um, smishing and vishing that we use as short forms to explain different types of phishing with it between ourselves. Um, and then we have phrases uh, more like, you know, leet and fud and uh, those sorts of, of phrases that fall more into the category of slang. Um, the thing is, we're not always very good at translating any of these things for non-specialists. And we're not always that good at explaining exactly what interpretation of a word, specialist jargon or slang, between ourselves as well. And, and some of these things can have um, just subtly different meanings, depending on who you're talking to. So we'll come on to that further on in the presentation. The big challenge with that is that it often makes security um, feel very overwhelming and inaccessible, even to people who are otherwise incredibly literate um, and, and find um, language reading most materials quite accessible. So what do we actually mean by plain language? So the concept of, of plain language isn't anything new. In fact, um, there is a quote that is attributed to Hippocrates that says the chief virtue that language can have is clearness and nothing detracts from it so much as the use of unfamiliar words. According to the International Plain Language Federation, the definition of plain language is that a communication is in plain language if its wording, structure and design are so clear that the intended readers can easily find what they need, understand what they find, and then use that information. Okay, plain language is not about dumbing down the information that we need to share. 
but it is about presenting it in a way that's easy for whoever we're talking to to understand and that can look very different for different groups of people so as i said later on i will share more practical tips about uh, writing using plain language but before i do that i do want to um, explain a little bit more about why it matters and actually um, some of the value behind using um, plain language so on this slide uh, you can see a, a chart that shows the levels of literacy for adults across the OECD countries. Um, the, that's the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, and it includes most of continental Europe, as well as Australia, Canada, the US and some parts of South America. Now, the data here is from um, the survey of adult skills that was published in 2019 and each of the colored bars shows the percentage of that um, nation's country's uh, population at a given literacy level now there are four sets of shading on these slides reading left to right um, on the left hand side of the slide you have people with the lowest levels of literacy and on the right hand side you have the greatest um, levels of literacy and down the middle roughly speaking we have a vertical bar and that vertical line that sits in in between the the yellow greeny section and the darker blue section um, approximately the middle of the chart um, or the the second set of shading from the left and the second in from the right um, there's a vertical line that line represents the minimum level of literacy that is required to be considered functionally literate and that is the level of literacy that's required for coping with everyday life. So just to help to um, explain that a little bit more, the colored section to the far left of the chart in orange is uh, made up of adults who are considered to be below uh, level one or below as far as um, their level of literacy. What that means is that these adults cannot read a text or understand the structure of sentences or paragraphs okay at level one they might be able to identify a single piece of information in a text if it's identical to information that is given in a question so if the text said bob's ball is red and the question said what color is bob's ball they might be able to answer that question. Okay. It isn't until level three, so the intersection that's marked by that uh, vertical line, the group just to the right hand side of that, the adults start to be able to read and navigate longer texts, longer pieces of information. And that is considered to be the minimum level of literacy that's required for coping with everyday life. And, and in a lot of cases, increasingly in modern life. For everyone that sits to the left and the left of that vertical line, things like navigating a bus timetable, reading a menu or recipe, or reading instructions are off the table. In the UK, that line represents about 49.5% of the adult population. And that is actually similar across much of, of Europe. Now, we tend to assume that everyone we're working with shares a similar level of literacy, can read as well as we can. But that couldn't be further from the truth. And actually, the more clearly and simply we can communicate important information, the more accessible it becomes.
On the other hand, uh, we have people who have incredibly high levels of literacy. So on that chart, the people at the very far right hand side. On this slide, I'm showing a quote that's taken from a government um, writing guide in the UK, specifically talking about writing well for specialists. So these are people that we can assume have higher levels of literacy and generally understand specialist terminology, jargon, acronyms specific to their field. So research shows that higher literacy people prefer plain English or plain language because it allows them to understand information as quickly as possible. In 2018, there was a study published uh, looking at the uh, preferences of a, a, a legal audience, um, a, a group of legal specialists into their preference for plain language. And that research found that of those surveyed, 80% of people preferred sentences written in plain English. The more complex the issue, the greater that preference became. Um, and for example, 97% of readers preferred to see the phrase, among other things, over the Latin inter alia. Now bear in mind that this is a group of specialist uh, legal professionals who are very, very familiar with these common Latin phrases because they litter our um, legal um, language in the UK. The survey also found that the more educated the person was and the more specialist their knowledge, the greater their preference became for plain, plain English. People tend to understand complex specialist language, higher level um, readers understand complex specialist language, but they don't actually want to read it if there's an alternative. And the reason for that is that the higher the level of literacy we have often translates into the amount of content and information that we have to process in any given day. Just think how many emails you receive every day that we communicate through Slack and messaging tools. And all of this requires reading or and without um, accessibility tools, it requires reading. We're bombarded with words all day, every day. So people who are highly literate, this can often mean that we're short on time and our reading demands, the reading demands that they have are incredibly high. And so it helps when we can access information really quickly. And plain language and reading simpler documents helps to make that easier to do. Plain language also has a, a lot of uh, benefit to play when we're working with people who are reading in a language other than their first. As we often work with international colleagues, and this is an international conference, this is something that we need to think about every time we put fingers to keyboard. Now, there is one thing that I want to add here, and that is that plain language can do a huge amount to help people with lower levels of literacy, as well as people who are just bombarded and overwhelmed with information every day. But that isn't enough for everyone. Some groups might still be excluded from accessing that information. And that includes people with very low levels of literacy, as well as those with um, specific disabilities or um, reading and comprehension difficulties. So when we're writing things like instructional texts and public information documents, so I don't necessarily just mean public public information, but think um, information documents that you need everybody in your organisation to understand. We might need to go one step further than plain language for these groups. That may include publishing alternative formats such as audio, or it might mean producing easy or simple language documents that are specifically designed for those groups 
developed in collaboration with them as well. That's a really important factor for easy and simple language documents. That is beyond the scope of my talk today, but I just wanted to include it because I think it's important that while plain language does a lot for improving accessibility, it doesn't make a text universally accessible. Now, as with all good things, there is a standard coming for plain language. Um, actually, there's been a standard in, um, in pipeline for a very long time, as you can see here. Um, in 2010, the International Plain Language Federation organizations proposed the development of a standard for plain language. Now, this standard, uh, as the wording is, it's plain language. So this is a universal standard. It is not a plain English standard, and it, it is uh, tries to be as language agnostic as it can. Um, the proposal for the development of an ISO standard for plain language was approved in 2019. And since then, there's a technical working group uh, that has been working on developing this standard which is representing 18 countries and around 20 languages um, there. The standard itself is due to be published later this year, so um, probably um, mid to late summer now um, we're talking. But because this is a security community and we live, there's standards coming out of our ears, I thought I'd share that we're not the only people with a lot of standards. Um, so yeah, plain language standard is, is coming. We can all uh, knock our socks off with that later. So that's the theory and the justification for plain language. But how do we go about writing clearly? How do we go about implementing plain language principles so that we can be more easily understood? What steps can we take towards writing in plain language? Well, in the words of Sir Ernest Gowers, be short, be simple, be human. Just to put that into context, um, Sir Ernest Gowers was a member of the civil service in the UK in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And he published uh, the first plain English guide, essentially, for uh, the use of the civil service and the UK government. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but it's called Plain Words. Um, my copy is quite well marked and, and things. It's, um, it's a really useful guide for plain English um, writing. And it stands up to the, against the test of time as well, though it has had a couple of revisions. So be short. This means using short sentences most of the time and not really saying that much more than we need to. Being simple is about using simple sentence structures, not making things too complex, and also thinking about the flow, the logical structure of our text as well. Explaining technical terms using simple or familiar words for people. And sometimes, depending on our audience, we might need to compromise the accuracy of those explanations in order to help someone understand a concept or principle enough to get through the rest of the document and what we need them to know. And being human is about knowing who you're writing for and what they need to know or do from the information that you've given them. And it's about writing for your readers using their language in ways that they understand. I'm going to elaborate on all of those over the next over the next few slides. So be short. It's about preferring short and concise sentences. And within one sentence, kind of not really saying that much more than you need to. It isn't. Um, it isn't taking away information though. So in the, the be short principle applies more at a, at a sentence 
level than at a full document level. When I've done um, plain English edits or effectively plain English translations for people, sometimes the plain English version of a document will be longer than the original version. Because if that document as a whole has a, a lot of specialist language in there, specialist uh, terminology, I'm gonna have to add more wording to explain what that means in order for the reader to be able to move on to the next section of the document and then to understand the document as a whole. Okay, so this is only at a sentence level being short. In your document, you need to include everything that you, that you want to say. It isn't, as I said at the beginning, it isn't about dumbing down information. It isn't about um, distilling things to the, um, you know, to, to a level that they're no longer meaningful. In fact, that is by far not the objective of plain language. If I just show you the example that's on the slide here, uh, we have diversity and synergy enhance the bandwidth of strategic mission critical tiger teams to touch base, shift paradigms, leverage best practices, think outside the box and push the envelope. When all we're really trying to say is that a well-run company gives decision makers the time to solve problems. Um, the, there is a challenge when it comes to um, short sentences all the time though. And that is that if we only use sentences that are a single clause at a time, our text can start to sound very robotic. So it is fine to, to flex that about a little bit, but the preference should always be for shorter sentences and ideally one, one concept or principle per sentence. As sentences get longer, there's more chance of them becoming confusing because we start to overload them with too much information. We might start to add lots of dependent details that could just as easily be in a separate sentence. To explain that one, I've got an example. So the committee, which had to provide a quorum decision, including consent from the CEO and CFO to approve the proposal was due to meet on Friday. What we're actually including in that one sentence there is an explanation about how the approval process for a decision works, plus some additional information about who needs to be involved in that um, approval. And then the, the, the core message is that the committee is due to meet on Friday, but it's quite hard to access that core message because there's so much stuff shoved in the middle of it. The other thing that we get with longer sentences, and this one's an example of, of it, is that we, it can get some sort of ambiguities creep in. It's much, much easier for ambiguities to creep in the longer our sentences become. So in this case, does the quorum decision mean that the CEO and CFO form part of that quorum? Or are they in addition to it? So does the committee provide a quorum and then the CEO and CFO go, to, go on to approve it? So if we were translating this into more plain language, we might say that um, approvals uh, or proposal approvals have to, be submit, have to be submitted to a committee, full stop. The committee has to provide a quorum decision, um, and then clarifying whether we mean in, and that the quorum includes the CEO and CFO, or that they are in addition to the quorum, full stop. The committee is due or was due to meet on Friday. Okay, so we've got, gone from one sentence to three, but what we've done is separate out that mush of information into more distinct parts. And another thing that uh, particularly in, in English and in, in a slightly different way in, in other languages we, we end up doing is using too many words or elements in the subject. We see this quite most commonly in journalistic writing, but it does creep in all over the place. 
the example that I've got here is, is more from a, a journalistic um, standpoint. So isolated instances of terrorist outfits manipulating the stock market to raise funds for their operations have been reported. Everything before the word have in that sentence is the subject. The longer the subject is, the harder it becomes to, to keep hold as a reader of who is doing the thing. And even identifying who, who is doing the thing in the first place can be really tricky depending on, on how that um, subject is described. So that's, that's something also to just, you know, to be aware of. These problems tend to go away when we think more in, in short and concise sentences. The next one, be simple. So I started by saying use simple words, but that's really not the best way to describe this. It is more about providing familiar words. And that's familiar to your audience, not necessarily what you consider to be familiar. It's about um, avoiding jargon terms if we can. Um, sometimes those jargon terms, particularly in our industry, I think um, sit somewhere between jargon and um, our specialist vocabulary. And where that's the case, you know, the, treat it as if it was a technical term and explain, provide a definition, provide an explanation in familiar language um, for any terms that your audience may be less familiar with. And as I also mentioned earlier on, it can be worth adding these familiar language or plain language, everyday language explanations for things even when we're talking between our peers because we all have a we, we all have a slightly different way of understanding everything and a way of understanding the, the terms that we have within our industry depending on our specialism okay and so it can help to things like cloud for example clouds can mean so many different things so including a brief explanation of that in your in your document even if you're writing for your peers so also security people also technology people can help just to make sure that everyone has a common understanding for that word in your document okay it 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 that is supporting your reader in understanding what you're trying to say I also mentioned earlier that sometimes it is worth compromising the accuracy of an explanation if it helps someone understand a concept that they need to be able to, to get the information from the document that, that they're reading. And so, as an example, if you're talking to a non-technical person, someone who doesn't have much network understanding, um, they have a phone, but they, you know, it's a bit alien. Um, you may, just hypothetically, need to explain what a firewall is to them. Now, if we're talking to our peers, we would need to explain what type of firewall, where it's sitting, what its function is, um, maybe what configuration we're applying to it, all of these things. But the biggest, the most important thing is you would need to specify the type of firewall for that to be likely meaningful. For someone who you're, you're trying to share some general security knowledge, you might explain a firewall as um, a barrier between their computer and the internet, between the organization and the internet, or between um, sensitive data and other parts of the business. And that may well be enough. They now have a concept for what the firewall does that they understand. And that can then get you onto the point of you maybe saying, and we need one, or we need budget for some more, or we need to upgrade ours, because now they understand in 
their terms in familiar terms the purpose of that thing um, of the firewall. So moving on, I just wanted to share a couple of examples here now of what um, plain language can do to, to a sentence. So the first one, when introducing new technology, we will implement a robust change management process. All of us here will use a phrase like that without even thinking about it because the change management process for us, we instantly know all of the steps that are in there. What people uh, listening or reading that sentence might need to take away is that when we make a change, we're just gonna do it carefully. Okay, fine. The next one, the department is leveraging feedback to benchmark satisfaction levels, utilizing the outcomes for the previous year. So this one's a nice like um, marketing-y, sales-y type thing. The department is using feedback to compare customer satisfaction levels to last year or employee satisfaction levels to last year or whatever, whoever's. And um, that's not actually clear. So, you know, you can see we've just taken out all of the garbage business language um, in there and just straightforward to the point. And then anybody that's worked with consultancies or um, any type of consulting um, where agency, whether that's security or, or otherwise, will have, I'm sure, seen some kind of line like the last one. We endeavor to fulfill our duties in accordance with the zenith of professionalism, meaning we aim to deliver our work to the highest standard. Um, so just say that because everyone understands what you mean. You don't sound, um, you know, it, yeah, you don't sound like such an idiot. Okay, so moving on, be human. So before I talk to this slide, I'm very aware that there is quite a lot of words in the cartoon. So I'm just going to explain the cartoon so you can concentrate on um, the point of the slide. The cartoon is um, is about some, is some dinosaurs and they're talking about the fact that in English, we don't, uh, in some ways of some schools of thought, we don't have a gender neutral single person pronoun. They recognize that uh, they is being used for that purpose, but argue that um, they is plural, which is what the um, prescript, more prescriptive grammarians would have us believe. Um, and they say, oh, we should have some others. And there's been other pronouns um, invented to fill this gap. So there's uh, here, fee, z, thon, um, and they decide that they like thon. Okay, so that's what the slide is about. That will, that's what the cartoon is. It will make sense later on. Being human is about knowing who you're writing for and why you're writing. And that's about what you need, either what they need to know or do or what you need them to do. OK, but when we're doing this, we need to put the reader first and we need to write a language that they understand. That means that we will be writing um, uh, we might write, this. if we were writing the same thing for different groups of people, we would, and we would need, they would look, the outcomes would look different. Okay, we wouldn't write, we, we wouldn't write the same document for our engineering teams who understand a lot more technical language and we would, um, for our, uh, you know, a more, more people-based team, for example. Uh, and one of the, the big things with this is uh, to make sure that we're being inclusive. It's about checking our biases. And it's also uh, really as much as being inclusive, it's about um, not being unintentionally exclusive. OK, so that's where the, the pronoun slide of the, the dinosaurs comes in. Um, we have he and she, and in order to be inclusive, some people think it's fine to go he slash she. That covers both sexes, both genders. Thing is, there's a massive group of people that sits in the middle of 
in the middle of that or either side of that or not within that at all. And um, they is generally now considered to be uh, a more inclusive term because it allows for a spectrum. There's no binary he, she, there's this wide spectrum. And then within security terms, things like preferring primary and secondary instead of master and slave and allow list, deny list rather than uh, whitelist and blacklist. It's about um, just not unintentionally excluding people or alienating people in the things that we're writing. I've included a link to a really good resource here, um, the Conscious Style Guide, that um, aggregates loads of online resources about writing um, for inclusivity. Uh, it also includes information about accessibility as well. Um, and there are specific uh, re resources on there for um, IP technology um, language as well. So it's a, it's a really cool resource to go and look at. I think the other thing with, with being human is about recognizing that that's exactly what we are. We are human. Um, when we are going through education, we're often taught um, to write incredibly formally. And uh, as we progress through academic studies, uh, university and research and things like that, um, that just gets more and more ingrained. And so when we leave academia, we've been sort of indoctrinated into this sort of academic style of writing, this incredibly formal use, use big words, however, is therefore, um, you know, and, and all of this stuff, it makes very messy writing uh, in, in no small part, because often we're given a word count target for the dissertation or whatever it is that we have to produce. And so we pad it with all of this filler language. And then when we move to into business, we hear all this kind of buzz stuff going around. So we, we and, and so we sort of, we take it all in and we reflect what we hear and read elsewhere in our own writing as well. So it is just thinking about those things and going, hang on, if I'm, I wouldn't say this stuff to anyone. So why am I writing it in that way? Uh, just, I think that's a really um, useful just thing to, to catch yourself on a little bit. There are other considerations that go into uh, plain language writing beyond the words that we use and they fall into to categories of layout and design. So this is things like using headings and subheadings and breaking text up into smaller sections. And, and as I said before, making sure that there's a logical flow to those sections. And actually the discipline of, of having to create sections will help that logic, you to process uh, that logic flow as well, um, which can help you then to explain something better in the future because that logic flow is more ingrained for you too. Use of color as well, that makes it, that can make a difference. Um, not so much when we're just doing, you know, uh, standard text, but if you are using color, one thing to be aware of is that there is sufficient contrast between the colors that you're using. Some colors are difficult to, you know, to take, to, to handle reading in, in any um, great amount. And some people can't access color. And um, if we fail to check that that contrast is sufficient, it can suddenly mean that they are excluded from uh, that information okay there are plenty of tools online that you can use to check um, a color palette and that uh, that you can also apply filters that check that those color palettes for contrast and for um, accessibility of people who have different forms of color blindness so um, yeah I if if anyone's interested in those drop me a note and I'll I'll put something up in the um, in Hoover after. 
Font choice, again, another important consideration here. So font choice might be the size of the font. So, you know, if you have to write a paper, if, if your organization, and I have been in places that say this, if you have to write a paper and it has to be no longer than four sides long, um, shrinking it down to font size six to make it fit isn't going to be great for getting people to read what you've written in the first place. So just, you know, the uh, publishing standard is equivalent to Arial font size 12. And then with, uh, you know, a slightly, with a wider than one, um, a slightly wider than single spaced lines as well. Just don't be afraid of stretching the lines out so that, so that text is just easier. It's easier to separate the lines out. It's faster for somebody to read representing uh, information in diagrams, tables and illustrations instead of in words where that is more appropriate to do. Just do that. Um, illustrations can be useful as well just to help to break up text uh, as well. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid of, of including diagrams and white space, uh, particularly if what you're sharing is going to be read on a screen where you don't need to worry about the cost of printing and ink and um you know and all of that stuff just make sure that there is white space so if in your sections that there is a wider space between each above each heading uh, and a little gap um slightly wider than your standard text width um between subheadings and the remaining content using bullet points and and things like that as well instead of comma separated lists like put those in bullet points it all adds white space for what that actually does it might make the number of pages longer, but it makes your document much faster to read because it, it sort of pops information into into people's um, minds a lot, a lot faster. And then I mentioned briefly um, as well, alternative formats for um, accessibility reasons so that's stretching just a little bit beyond the scope of this of this talk, but audio. Um, is is definitely one uh, that, that can be quite straightforward to do. Um, but yeah, just make sure that you're aware of any groups that might need alternative formats for information. So uh, I hope that this has been kind of useful presentation, probably a bit different from a lot of the talks over the last couple of days. Um, but I think that um, language is really important because communication is the core of what we do in security. Uh, we do some incredible things within security and as security professionals. Um, but I think it's sad that so many of us in the profession end up feeling incredibly frustrated by it because we don't necessarily get the buy-in and support and engagement from the people that we work with. And a lot of that is down to a difficulty in explaining what we're doing, explaining things um, so that they understand um, and can provide that support to us. So in today's talk, I've um, explained a bit about what plain language is and uh, how it can kind of help us. Um, it can help to save time, money and resources through it being faster for people to get the information we need them to understand and make a decision or to use that information. Um, that saves so much time and energy for us as well, because uh, we're not having to do so much backwards and forwards to explain and clarify things. It can help to improve compliance, because if people understand what we need them to do, they are more likely to do it. And it affects customer satisfaction, whether that's a, a, an end customer or a client or internal uh, people that we work with day in, day out, because uh, we're just suddenly a bit more approachable and accessible and less scary and less overwhelming. Uh, I have also provided you with lots of practical tips for writing more clearly. I have tried to keep these as um, general as possible so that they don't just apply to English, although my examples have all been in English. Um, so in summary for that, be short, be simple, 
be human. And I just want to close uh, my talk with uh, the quote on the page. Don't underestimate your reader's intelligence, but don't overestimate their knowledge of a particular field. When writing about science, don't simplify the science, simplify the writing. And if we swap the word for security, I think that this is um, definitely a principle that we uh, can take away. When writing about security, don't simplify the security simplify the writing. So if you uh, want to get in touch with me, I've put my details on the slide here, um, as well as a couple of links um, related to plain language. So there's a plain language association, there's loads of plain language resources um, on there. And I've also linked to that survey of adult skills, which um, I showed the literacy data from as well. This is my grown up Twitter handle. Um, my other Twitter handle is Fairy Cake Pixie um, as well. So, yeah. And um, with that, thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, is there any questions? Yeah, thank you, Om, for the, uh, the interesting sessions. Uh, very insightful. Um, I see there are no questions in the QA, but I've got two of them. Um, is plain, uh, plain language appropriate when writing for technical teams about technical subjects? Yeah, yeah. So um, when we're writing for our peers, it's really about making sure that they can take in information really quickly. And plain language can help us to do that. It can also help just with... Um, one of the things that I mentioned was that um, we individually can have very subtly different understanding of what a word means, what a term means, what it applies to. Um, and so even though we share a common language in this case of security, um, it, there can still be a lot of value in just clarifying within this text, this is what this term means. Um, and that just helps uh, to get rid of some of that um, ambiguity or the risk for something to be misinterpreted. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Um, and the second one, plain language helps readers. How, how does it help us when we are writing? Uh, so, as writing, it, it's as far as writing goes, we don't have to try to seek that sort of elevated um, academic style of writing that we, or, like I say, we can often end up being indoctrinated into. We can can write more like we would speak to someone in a meeting, and that can take a bit less brain power to do. Um, it takes a bit of practice because we're so used to you know, creating formal papers and formal documentation and, and speaking to certain people in, in a really formal way that um, plain language, it doesn't mean that, that you're not respectful, polite and all of those things in what you're saying, um, but it just means that what you've said is really clear um, and easy to understand for people. Um, so I think, um, as writers as well, the one of the biggest benefits that we can get from, from it is just that what we've written is understood and people do what we need them to do with what we've written. Um, so that's it, particularly in security, I think is one of the biggest benefits that we can get from it. Yeah, indeed, yeah, that's very clear. Um, so yeah, I want to thank you um, for, uh, for this session and uh, it, it's time to wrap up. Thank so, you. Thank you, Lars. Thank, thank you. I want to have me. Yeah. And uh, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. Bye bye.